Okay. Um, you can ask questions addressed to specific individuals on the panel or uh, to the panel in general. Um, please wait until the microphone is given to you because all things. Uh, let me just uh, at the beginning make uh, one brief remark about uh, queens and kings. <laughs> um, um, now, economics is the queen of the social sciences and the king of the social science for a very elementary reason. Uh, that is because economics is a science more akin to logic. Uh, there are pure arguments that are used, whereas psychology is, of course, an empirical science. Um, it, it's in the same sense that mathematics or logic, for instance, would be ranking supreme over the natural sciences, physics, and chemistry. In the same sense, of course, economics ranks supreme over any of the empirical social sciences. If you have statements such as, uh, if out of your income uh, the demand for one good increases, the demand for another good necessarily has to go down. This is something that does not require any type of empirical testing. It is just a simple logical statement. Psychology does not have statements of this kind. So in this sense, um, uh, I do have to disagree with, with my friend uh, Richard Lynn. Um, he is a king in his own realm, but <laughs> but we are then we are then the Kaisers. <laughs> First question. I have a question and a critical remark for Marco Bassani. Uh, first, my question, what is the difference between what you critically call the grand libertarian illusion uh, that you only have to destroy the dichotomy between the public and the private sphere in the mind and your own recommendation in the end that uh, you mainly have to overcome the state in, in your mind? Uh, and my critical remark is you uh, said that libertarianism was in a way a reaction to the failure of classical liberalism. Now I'm wondering uh, isn't it uh, rather the case that originally libertarianism started out as a revival of classical liberalism, but only because classical liberalism had become absolutely useless to the state and thus effectively protected libertarians from any political influence uh, and thus, thus fostered a research tradition which helped to bring back to the surface certain insights such as the utter failure of classical liberalism uh, early on. Thank you. Great question. Next. <laughs> no, all right, just uh, on the second part, I totally agree. You're, you're probably right. That's, uh, I would just uh, follow your analysis. On the first part, no, I didn't say that uh, the state exists only in the mind of the people and then it's over. You just tell them uh, the dichotomy of public uh, sphere and private law makes no sense and then uh, they realize it, wake up the next morning and the state is gone. No, that was not what I, was, what I meant by that. You see, many times I debate these things about the historicity of the state and, uh, and one thing you have to keep in mind, the state is two things, an intellectual construction and an institutional reality and they both always go together. You cannot have a state where the, there's no intellectual, uh, intellectual construction. So when I talk about sovereignty, Jean Baudin and so on, there's always some idiots that says, well, sovereignty was working 5,000 years ago in China. Right, but as if sovereignty actually existed, so you can go around and look for sovereignty to just operate and operates normally. It's not sovereignty, it's the theories on sovereignty that are the actual and real thing. And they are as real as sovereignty itself, but the only problem is you cannot have sovereignty without the theories of sovereignty. So you cannot go around and just watch the Roman Empire and you say, yeah, here, this empire, Marcus Aurelius had sovereignty because sovereignty did not exist. Nobody spoke in those terms and actually Jean Baudin was uh, was not there yet uh, with the six books on the state. 
So that's exactly what I meant. It's in the mind of the people, but it's also in the mind of the politicians. A politician could never rule without reference to the state and to that, uh, what Karlschmidt called the Jus Publicum Europeum, to all that tradition. You know, even Adolf Hitler, by the way, somebody told me that uh, in Britain there was a program where, where people asked, uh, what was the name of Hitler? And the answer was Heil. <laughs> that was pretty amazing. But anyway, so even Adolf Hitler who didn't care too much about the state, but um, he was a little bit obsessed by other concepts like race and so on, had to use during the political struggle all this, con the whole of the construction of the state of this artificial person that basically represents nobody. Neither the rulers nor the ruled. It uh, doesn't represent anybody. You know, it's just there and it's a machine and it goes on by itself. And also it's nurtured by a lot of myths. And the first myth is the idea that it always existed. And that's one myth that libertarians haven't get gotten rid of. What you are saying, if I, understand, if I understand this correctly, um, is basically that you say, yes, of course, if the people don't believe in the legitimacy of the state, in the existence of the state, then it would not have any power over them. But if and as long as they do believe in it, then it does have power over them, right? It, or do I misunderstand what you are saying? No, of course not. No, no, it's perfect. I mean, the only thing, it is such a big if <laughs> that uh, I'm ready to give it to you. The only thing we, we have to realize, it's a big if. It took 500 years to build this idea of the state as an artificial person, and um, it's not going to take a couple of books to destroy it. Hans, is that all? Should be. Uh, Hans, when you speak of uh, this limited government as being an impossibility, I absolutely believe that. But here at uh, both LRC and Mises Org, we are supporting a Ron Paul and a Rand Paul uh, as a political choice, and they do speak to strict construction of the Constitution. They do speak of this minarchist, a state that could be okay. And yet, from your views, can you tell me just directly, is this not more dangerous, more dishonest, and more harmful for us to kind of do little tiny baby steps towards trying to limit a government as opposed to just speaking openly, as you do, about how impossible it would be to limit a state. And can you tell me what would that kind of uh, discussion and movement look like? As a, um, again, uh, Ron Paul and uh, Randall Paul are politicians. Uh, I'm. I'm a scholar. Uh, I'm committed to the truth. They don't have to be committed to the truth. They have strategic, uh, strategic objectives. Um, yes, I think uh, uh, what they basically promote is the same sort of thing that people say that we turn um, some, um, we st turn stones into uh, into bread, uh, or what the alchemists try to do, uh, uh, use um, uh, certain materials in order to create gold, or to some people still try to work on squaring the circle. Yes, the fact that some people pursue certain things of which we know this is an impossible goal uh, does not uh, change the fact that it is an impossible goal. Many people pursue some things that are absolutely impossible to do. And in this sense, I think they pursue an impossible, uh, impossible goal. And as scholars, it is our obligation to point, to point this out. 
have a question for Mr. Richard Lynn. Uh, now, I am curious, uh, is the, you were correlate, uh, is there, could there be a, uh, what you're do, uh, taking as correlation, uh, causality might be actually be correlation? Because there are two or three things that make me think that there might be errors in your conclusion. Uh, one is that all the low IQ, low IQ places are warmer countries. And it's very difficult, and I grew up in a warm country. Uh, it's, it's very, people usually have in a hot climate when you're outside during the daytime here in the afternoon, your thinking is cloudy. You can't think clearly anymore. So is that genetics which leads to low IQ, or is it hot climate which is a temporary thing which, leads, which might lead to low IQ? And the other thing is, and I, let me complete this thing, there's another issue which I was just thinking about, is public education. I mean, I have been coming, living in and out of the West for the last 20 years, and I have seen that the IQ of the Western people has dropped significantly in the last 20 years. The last generation when I came here in, in early 90s was, you know, passionate, curious, freedom-loving people. Compared to what we have today, in, in, in the Western countries, in the UK, in Canada, in America, I see very stupid uh, early 20s and late teens uh, people who are dumped down version of humanity, a result of public education. So global all I'm saying, sorry? It's global war. <laughs> <laughs> so so in, in short, my question is, is it, uh, genetics which leads to low IQ or there are many other temporary social factors which, <coughs> which resulted in result or resulted in lower IQ. Thank you. Uh, two questions raised there. One is the climate, climate question. As uh, was observed, there is a climatic dimension to this. It's the people in the cooler climates of northern of Europe and Northeast Asia who have the highest IQs and the, as you go down into the warmer climates, North Africa through the South Asia, they fall a bit, and as you get into the hotter climates, they fall still further. This observation was first made by Montesquieu in 1748 in his book, uh, L'Esprit des Lois. He drew attention to this, and he made very much kind of suggestions that you did. It's uh, the heat, it's exhausting, there are more tropical diseases which uh, impair people. Uh, but uh, I think this, uh, a serious problem for this analysis is Singapore, which actually hit, lies on the equator, but of course is mainly inhabited by Chinese. About 78% of the population are Chinese. Singapore is a very prosperous country same per capita income roughly as in Western Europe. So they don't, this is kind of experiment. You might say the Chinese move were, came for some reason rather to Singapore in the 19th century. They, because they have these high IQs, they made it into a very prosperous country. And uh, they're not, they don't suffer from these climatic problems. So I think we might say this is a beautiful theory spoilt by one ugly fact. As for the um, second point of whether IQs have fallen off, declined in the last 20 years or so in the West, uh, that is not the case. Uh, we monitor, there's a lot of work monitoring IQs year by year, a little of industry on this, and IQs have been static uh, in many countries this last 20 years or so. Um, to, to, the cl to the climate question, um, so if we assume there are genetic differences, uh, then the next question would, why are there genetic differences between uh, people high in the north and people in the south? And there I think climate does, does seem to play a role. Um, obviously, uh, the, the, select, the selection, the pressure of selection, so to speak, is uh, to select for higher intelligence, the pressure is higher if you live, into, live in regions that are challenging regions. Um, 
uh, life in the Mediterranean region, for instance, is already <coughs> far easier uh, than it is, let's say, in Finland or Norway or northern Germany. Um, so if you want to become successful as a, as a person, um, you have to be, um, the, the selection tends to be more in favor of higher intelligence uh, in, northern, in northern region uh, and being intelligent is less important in, uh, in more southern regions uh, where even if you are not particularly intelligent you can lead a decent life. Um, in northern in northern regions, it is almost impossible, especially if you just imagine a pre-industrial society. Uh, it would be almost impo impossible um, to just uh, laze around, uh, do nothing, have no foresight, and so forth. You will simply die out. In order to survive, there must be a selection, a stronger selection, in favor of developing higher degrees of intelligence. That's what, what I think is a plausible explanation for the genetic differences that exist. The genetic differences also have a cause. Uh, and the cause is uh, different skills are necessary in order to become a successful, um, successful person who raises, brings up the next generation, who brings up the next generation in some, gener in, in some territories um, than, than in other territories. Obviously, n none of these mechanisms nowadays works anymore as they did thousands of years ago. I mean, now we have air conditioning uh, and so forth. Um, but all the breeding and so forth has, of course, taken place under entirely different, uh, under indif uh, entirely different circumstances that are now long gone. Perhaps Richard could uh, speak about also the Well, since uh, about 1880, uh, the genetic quality of the population for intelligence and probably also for personality qualities has deteriorated in economically developed countries. And the reason for that is that uh, intelligent people have been having fewer children than unintelligent people. So obviously it follows that in each generation there are more unintelligent, because intelligence is transmitted down through families, uh, more unintelligent children are being born in successive generations. This occurred about 1880, and we have to blame our German cousins for this, because it was some clever German in about 1870 who invented the modern latex condom as we know it today. And once that had been invented, this dysgenic fertility became inevitable. It was inevitable that intelligent people would use this more efficiently than unintelligent people. And so it came about. And so this has progressed over six generations or so since the 1880s. And uh, so our genetic intelligence is decreasing. But this is compensated by some rise in intelligence because of improved environment. Intelligence is determined both by our genes and by our environment, particularly by the quality of nutrition. So these two things have, to some degree, set each other off. So uh, as uh, Richard said, this is, to some degree, exacerbated by welfare states because the welfare state sustains less intelligent people, even encourages them to have children. As um, Charles Murray pointed out in his well-known book, Losing Ground, uh, it, it was, uh, we all feel very sympathetic to the poor living on welfare and single mothers. It would be very nice to give them more money. We would all be in favor of that, but the more money we give them, the more these people essentially have a choice between having children and remaining on welfare or not having children going to work. So the more money we give them through a welfare state, the more these people who have this choice will opt for welfare and will have children. So the uh, welfare state undoubtedly exacerbates this dysgenic trend. 
One can yeah, but add one, one additional consideration. We had, for most of mankind, we lived in the Malthus in a Malthusian age, so people dying out en masse. Um, we only have, since the so-called Industrial Revolution, a situation where the average standard of living rises and the population size rises at the same time. For most of, for most of mankind, there was practically no increase in average standards of living. Uh, people in ancient Rome were not fundamentally richer than people in ancient Babylon. Uh, people in, uh, let's say, 1750 in England were on the average not richer than people were in Rome. Uh, the largest number of people were simply wiped out due to economic constraints that existed. In, under, those, under those conditions, uh, the people who did survive and did bring up offspring, successfully brought up offspring, were the economically successful people who had more surviving offspring and so over time you bred, so to speak, a higher average intelligence in the population. Since the Industrial Revolution, and that is, so to speak, a very unique moment in, in human history. We live in the, under these conditions only for 250 years. Um, so since, since the Industrial uh, Revolution, um, it is no longer the case, as it used to be before, that the economically more successful, which are by and large the, also the brighter people, uh, have a larger number of children, surviving offspring. Yeah. Now it is possible, has become possible because of the success of the Industrial Revolution, um, that people, um, even if they are um, not economically success successful and less bright can bring up children uh, who have again children and so forth. So since the Industrial Revol Revolution, I think a dysgenic effect has somehow uh, taken, uh, become important that did not exist prior to, to the uh, event of the Industrial Revolution. Yeah, but can I say one thing just uh I think intelligence in uh, Richard Lynn's perspective and is much overrated. <laughs> now, first of all, we just we very simply need, need idiots to fill up academic positions and uh, journalists and so on. And then the other thing is I know a guy who's got probably 191 in IQ and you probably know him as well and I won't say the name. but. I'd rather be an idiot, a savage idiot living in a land, you know, a plenty, a very warm climate and so on uh, than, uh, than this guy. So uh, just my, my point is uh, it's much overrated intelligence and, uh, and idiocy is certainly underrated. So we should, uh, we should just, uh, <laughs> we should uh, put things in perspective, in a different perspective. Uh, it, it seems to me that there are, uh, there are elements sort of the IQ uh, picture uh, which can certainly be called into question. And uh, uh, what, one of the things that I, in fact, I've discussed with Richard is, you know, why is it that Jews score very high in the United States and score a bit lower than, uh, than white Europeans in Israel? And his answer is, well, there's some sort of Sephardic Jews or something in the, in the racial mixture who are not quite as bright. And my, my, my response is they don't study very much there. They're mostly in the military. There's very little emphasis on education. And uh, I suppose his response would be, well, IQ tests really don't test for this, you know, and educational environment isn't that, that important. But uh, to, to, to me, even if, you know, in some cases the data would seem inadequate, uh, especially looking at a very, very large country. And so I think that examinations of cognitive genetic differences is very important. Um, a, because there seems to be at least some truth in this, uh, probably a good deal of truth. Um, B, we have been so brainwashed in the United States and Europe to attribute everything to oppression, racism, sexism, uh, uh, cultural variables, which are never the fault of people who are not doing as well. 
Uh, then we also get these simplistic views about culture, which I know Richard likes to parody, that we're going to give you an injection of the right values, and this is going to improve you. Um, and uh, I, I also sort of like, it's almost a kind of Calvinist view that, that uh, Richard presents, that as hard as you work, you cannot get salvation, uh, because it's all sort of faded. I like that. I, I like the, the fadedness of things. Uh, uh, <laughs> I suppose it's my anti-egalitarian prejudice that makes me like that. But, uh, uh, but, but there are things that you really cannot change. Um, I, I think, of course, I would not want to tell people who do have lesser cognitive abilities, they shouldn't work hard, because they should work hard, uh, but they're not going to do as well in the end. Maybe you don't, maybe you don't want to tell them that, um, but I think, I think it is important for people who are savvy to understand that there are natural cognitive differences and that they are inherited uh, within restricted gene pools. Um, and it may not be the whole picture uh, in explaining um, uh, inequality and achievement, but it does explain something. It explains perhaps a good deal. Um, and at, at the very least, you know, it's something that we should be allowed to discuss openly, which we are not allowed to do in the United States, because we have to accept cultural Marxist explanations for everything, um, or else the silly neoconservative alternative, we have to give people injections of values or cultural values. And I think we have to recognize there are things beyond those uh, injections of cultural values uh, in beating up on the dominant white culture, which explains why people are not going to have the same achievements. One, one additional remark to this too. I mean, why are we discussing these sorts of things? Be on the one hand, because they are absolutely taboo subjects. Um, this, the second thing is, if you start with a premise that all people are equal, and then you see different outcomes, then immediately the cry is, something is wrong here, there must be discrimination, uh, there must be mistreatment of this group or that group. As soon as we recognize what everybody knows, uh, from kindergarten on, there are some people are good at things and others just don't hack it. Uh, as soon as we realize there are tremendous differences among people, we expect that the outcomes should be tremendously different, and then we can say, so what if people just want, isn't that terrible that these people have achieved this and these other people have achieved something far greater? Uh, that's the way life is. There is nothing bad about it, nothing wrong about it. It doesn't follow that people who are not intelligent should be treated in any way different, differently. It, we just recognize the fact and, uh, and say, so what? Uh, but if we take the assumption that everybody is equal and then are astonished, how can, if everybody is equal, the outcomes be so different, and then conclude from that something must be done about it, then we are obviously on an entirely wrong path. Uh, so these things have to be sp spoken about. Um, I know that libertarians are also terrible when it comes to this subject. I have many libertarian enemies who just say, Hopper talks about these types of things. We shouldn't talk about these sorts of things. No, we have to talk about everything that is true. Um, that it, it doesn't help us to just blind ourselves to something that is obvious to everyone who just walks around the street and sees how people do in class, how they do in, 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 in various jobs, how successful some are and how lousy others are. What's wrong with it? It's easy to recognize. And nobody is allowed to talk about it. Yeah, at the risk of uh, repeating some things that I noted that here in my presentation, is that on now? Okay. Uh, at the risk of repeating myself, uh, the, the left thinks about race much more than Richard Lynn does. Uh, the left, uh, the left. That's all they think about race, and I think this is a very important aspect to to what Paul talks about of the uh, the transition from that kind of older Stalinist communist left to this new multi-culti globalist uh, global American you know fun time left of we're going to all be together uh, interchangeable and you know gay and, and whatever. Um, uh, you know, th th this is a very important aspect, and, and race is really the f most fundamental aspect. This is the way they're attacking people at universities. This is a way you, to, to solve the income and achievement uh, and education gap between blacks and whites. I mean, think of how many 
billions of dollars are spent on that in, in, in California or ac across the country. I mean, it is the dominant uh, engine that, that's mo motivating the state. And it, I mean, it would be nice not to talk about these things because they're kind of nasty. I mean, when, when someone tells me that, you know, Asia, East Asians have a higher IQ than, than um, you know, uh, Anglo-Saxons, uh, I, I, I'm not deeply offended. I don't go home and cry and decide, <laughs> oh, I guess I can never achieve, you know, that level. Um, I, you know, I, I don't think uh, any culture needs to, to act like that. Every culture has its, uh, its own, uh, own destiny, its own, uh, you know, its own, uh, you know, powers. Um, uh, but, you know, this is where the battle is, and you can't choose how you defend yourself. I mean, if someone is attacking you, uh, if they, they're sending ships and they're attacking you by sea, you have to attack them by sea. You can't just decide that we owe we as, you know, paleo-conservative Catholics, we don't, we don't talk about that stuff, and therefore we're going we're gonna to go have a land battle. You can't do it. Uh, you have to address the race issue. Yes, uh, I will have a, a question to uh, Professor Bassani and to Professor Lin later. Uh, Professor Bassani, in your talk, you, um, in your deconstruction of the libertarian view of the state, uh, you accept it, uh, however, the view that there is, is from the day is a fundamental distinction between uh, voluntary exchange and uh, violent acquisition of property between economic uh, means and political means of acquiring property, but then you mentioned that this is not really the essence of the state. That I understood it as uh, saying that the monopoly over the political means is not the essence of the state. But you did not really, in my opinion, uh, explain what the essence of the state would be then. Could you expand on this point and say what, uh, in your opinion, is the essence of the state? And also you mentioned that a historical analysis would be fundamental for grasping this. Could you clarify a little bit there? No, you're right. You're right. I said uh, I said that 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 was part. It was true. It was very important. The idea of plunder and property—that's uh, the basic idea of the libertarian explanation of the state. What <coughs> what I meant is that the state has got an historical dimension that is totally forgotten by most libertarians. That is somehow forgotten by very many libertarians. Uh, I will I will write a long article about the what, what the essence is of the state, but the only way to get that essence is to go and study history. It's not a sociological model that's good for uh, uh, Babylon, uh, Rome, uh, the Greek um, polis, uh, and the Middle Ages. It's, um, it came up and uh, during a certain time and a certain period uh, the state, and, uh, and this is exactly the reality we're facing right now, this personal, this artificial person that was created. Actually, the essence of the state was uh, best defined by Carl Schmitt, uh, which is to give juridical, um, to, to give the juridical uh, dresses to the political, right? So the idea is to transform all that is political into the into juridical facts, legal. Everything becomes legal, and that was uh, part of the modernity of the state, and that's that is what happened to the with the modern state. Uh, in in my opinion, most libertarians still analyze the state as a political phenomenon. They have no grasp of uh, of the legal and theoretical legal framework that's behind it. Not only not only I'm not only talking about the political philosophy or like uh, Thomas Hobbes, John Locke and so on, they of course know all that. But the core, the essence of the state is I will encompass all the political reality with laws. So the laws will be, everything will be determined by the juridical system. The juridical becomes the political. But, you know, it, it, we could... Uh, Marco, I... I Addressing uh, Nikolai's question, w wouldn't you still say it is a necessary part of the de definition of a state that they are acquiring property through non-productive means? Even if you would not go as far as to say this is a sufficiently detailed definition of the state, isn't that always part of the definition? It is, it is. It's part of the definition, it is true, but it's like the archaic part of the state. It's uh, 
the new part of the state is much more important and it's, uh, it's there and it's the juridical. And uh, so, but, but the, you know, like uh, it's part of the, the ancient, it's like, it would be like talking about the Catholic Church of the beginning. And it's still important. The, the bishops, uh, they used to get married, uh, everybody, you know, in the primitive church and uh, the primitive teaching. Yeah, everything is, is important. It's still there. But if you want to talk about the Catholic Church as it is, you shouldn't talk about the Catholic Church under the, the Roman Empire. But you should talk about the Catholic Church after the 1500s, right? So uh, I would say that that's part, that's part and parcel, and it's very important of the state, but it's my, in my opinion, it's certainly not the core. Yeah, I, I would like to add to this since I have actually written a lot on the, on the, on the history of the state, um, and I think Marco is right when he stresses the modernity of the state. And by modernity, um, I mean that it comes into existence basically in the 16th, 15th, 16th centuries, and it is based on the acquisition of land uh, which is unified by, by the crown, which is unified under, uh, eventually under a uniform juridical system and a uniform bureaucracy, uh, which sort of extends down into regions uh, and brings everything under royal jurisdiction. What happens to that state in time, uh, and I think it's a kind of continuing development into the 19th century, is that it becomes more and more a limited state. Uh, John Locke is not the exception. John Locke is writing to defend a particular political order. And it is, it, it, even if he talks about states of nature or natural right, he's simply using the language of 16th century Presbyterians and others who also talked about natural rights, states of nature. And the same thing with Jesuits in Spain who did the same thing. And the, the reason is they were trying to place limits on sovereignty, on royal sovereignty. Um, Hobbes, <clears throat> in a sense, is also defending a limited state. It is limiting to protect, it's limited to the function, a primary function of protecting life. I think the major difference in the state is when you get to the democratic welfare state. Because for the first time, the state has, uh, I mean, to use the, uh, I think the, the language of Oakshot, which applies here, it's a telocratic kind of state. It exists to achieve an egalitarian goal um, it is going to redistribute income. It is going to uh, give, uh, some, uh, expose everyone to the same kind of socialization process, right? Um, develops family policies. It interferes in civil society massively in the end, as it does in our time, right? And this is a very different, it also in terms of the reach of bureaucracy, there's no way you can compare the governments of the 17th century to, to modern day governments. The, the bureaucracy have far more, and part of it is based on the legitimacy of democracy itself. I mean, this is not government that most people oppose. They're quite happy to have the government look after them. Uh, so that in terms of its reach, uh, in terms of its having an aim toward which the entire state organization is going to be built up, this is a very different state. The, 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 uh, from what it says before, the other point I think that Marco may be alluding to is that the state is a theoretical construct at first. People like Baudin and others, uh, even Machiavelli, are writing about um, the state as a kind of, uh, of course Hobbes not only has a, this, a, a theoretical justification for sovereignty in the state, but has, you know, has the image of it as Leviathan, uh, a mortal god. Um, but one has to keep in mind that the state that they're talking about is very primitive in comparison to the modern state. Yes, but, but it's a very natural development. Uh, but, uh, my, but I, my point is it's very natural from, from, from that kind of state to the welfare state. The only thing is, for the very first time in the 1500s, with the absolute monarchies in Europe, they really tried to reach what was called the plenitude of potestatis, that is, to control society and people as well. And they did that not at a stroke. I mean, it took the French Revolution, it took Napoleon, and it took everything else to go on. And then finally, you get to the stage, which you, you can say, yeah, I wish we, we were back then, but, but that's part of the logic of the state. There was no change. If you take a look, the only thing is they couldn't get their, that total status in the 1700s. 
there had to be a revolution. And there was the French Revolution, and then that put the state again above society. So, but the, the whole idea is the state that controls society. Actually, if you take a look at taxation, let's say the state begins or could begin the idea of the state or so on, it could begin the 1400s or so, and then you take a, a look at the taxation and up to 1910, it goes from 3.5 to 7, that goes down and then it goes up, but it's never more than 10% of the gross national product. And then, even in 1960, do you know what the average taxation was in uh, rich countries? Take a wild guess. 13. All right, it's in your book. All right, it's in your book, so don't take a wild guess. Tell me. <laughs> no, the, all right, so it was, it, was, it was, all right, it was nothing. Let's say 13, 14, 15 percent of the very most. So actually what happened was between 1960 and 1990, and there are not, there's not a single explanation for what happened. But the, my only point would be that it's, it's a natural growth of all these ideas of the artificial person, and it follows the line of Machiavelli, Baudin, Hobbes, and, uh, and certainly not that of uh, Althusius, Thomas Jefferson, or the other view of the political community. I uh, beg to disagree with you on this point. I, I think that you, the Usually you like to disagree with No, I, I, I know, but I, I, in, order, in order to be polite, I have to say right. I beg to disagree with you. Okay. But if you look at the state in the 19th century, it is very different from the state in the 20th century. And as I argue my book on after liberalism, it is the, inter it is the science of government or the pseudoscience of government, uh, which the French and later the Germans develop and then the Americans take over uh, with profound gratitude uh, in the end, uh, and democracy. Um, what you have in the 19th century is usually a very limited franchise, together with limited powers that are accorded to the state. Um, and uh, 19th century sort of conservative liberals like uh, Guizot, François Guizot in France, says that you know, power should rest with the classe capacitaire, by which he means the, yeah, the educated middle class. Um, and the, but the powers of the state are also very limited. It is the expectation of people in a democracy that the government will look after them, equalize fortunes, and do other things that are seen to be part of a kind of democratic mandate, uh, and that it will be carried out you know, not by mass action, but by scientific administrators that I think are the distinguishing marks uh, of the state since the 20th century. Um, All right, very I have, short. I have, I have written on this, of course, uh, yes. uh, subject also, um, the transition from traditional monarchies uh, to democracies gradually expanding the franchise in the 19th century, and that goes hand in hand, so to speak, with the expansion of the power. Democracy is, so to speak, the invention uh, in order to make people put up uh, with the fact that you have people, people ruling over you. Um, uh, Bertrand de Juvenel used the example, uh, yes, of course, you, you hate the, the kings and so forth because you know that you will never be able to become king. Because of this, you resist it um, if he tries to expand his power. On the other hand, if everybody has a chance to become king, so to speak, or prime minister or senator or whatever it is, you have a consolation prize. You still don't like it if they rip you off. But on the other hand, you might end up on the other side of the whole deal. And this then explains the dramatic expansion uh, of uh, uh, government sectors as part of the overall economy that takes place, uh, especially since World, uh, since World War I. World War I, the end of World War I was, so to speak, uh, the, big, the big divide uh, b before that you still had uh, traditional uh, authorities, kings, uh, the aristocracy, and so forth. Most of that disappears after after World War One. Uh, the world becomes fully democratized. Uh, men and women can vote. In some countries, it starts a little bit later. Switzerland did. Uh, extremely well as long as the women did not have the right to vote. As soon as that was introduced, Switzerland also increased the speed with which they uh, went down the drain. Um, in, uh, in 1914, <coughs> you had no, no country in Europe 
that took more than 15% in taxes as compared to GDP or GNP, whatever you look at, um, by, by, 19, by 1960, by the late 1960s, yes, you have in Europe everywhere reaching a level of 50%. It cannot go up much faster uh, because obviously the economies will collapse if you go further than this. So they, they do have internalist, uh, internalized some of the insights in the, of the Laffer curve, uh, realizing you, you cannot raise uh, the tax rate uh, indefinitely without uh, the tax revenue uh, tax revenue declining. So I think my my explanation would be because traditional societies, monarchical societies, with the clear-cut hierarchies which recognize that humans are different, um, they put a definite limit on the possibility of expanding state power and democracy was invented in order to overcome the problems that monarchies had in making the state grow. Um, everybody can become king and because of this uh, you are willing to put up with far more than you would put up if you know there is no way that I can get into that position. I will always be a uh, low life, uh, but nowadays that everybody can go any place, uh, everything has become possible, so to speak. Just, just one, one thing. So from, from the point of view of the story of the state, actually what, what you say is all true, but it, the answer is that the very concept of sovereignty, which is the key concept of the state theoretical framework, actually works better with the people than the body of the king. It was invented for the body of the king, and then somehow, this is the real mystery of the state, something really personal that was constructed around one figure, the king, as it is in Machiavelli. You know, politics is just to get power and maintain power from one per for one person and the little entourage of that person. But then, the whole story of the state was to develop the most impersonal command of them all. You know, you see John Adams in the United States, he says, says our dream is for a govern government of laws, not of men. And if you ask classical liberals nowadays, uh, and you tell, would you rather be governed by good men or bad laws? And they would all go for bad laws, not us, because we know better, but... Uh, uh, so the idea is, that sovereignty was very flexible and finally found its best locus, the body of the people. Could be the people, the nation, and so on. But uh, so my answer still is, it's a very natural development from the doctrine of the state. Uh, hi, I, I guess my question is really now a little old, but I was going to ask um, Professor Lin um, regarding Singapore as an exception. <laughs> We've moved on since then, but I guess I put my hand up a little too early. Um, I, I remember a professor of mine at university saying that there's a, there's a theory that the introduction of air conditioning has um, changed uh, some areas somewhat dramatically. The most, I guess the most, um, the most notable example, the southern states of the US, how they've risen economically since the end of the Second World War. And, um, and, and the same argument is made for Singapore. And I'm just wondering whether or not the exception really is an exception when you consider that Singapore now, if you, is it, being a city state, is almost entirely in an air conditioned um, uh, city. And the people working there live um, in fairly uh, you know, climate controlled um, offices and, and, and stores and things like that. Whether or not you, you given that the city is now almost entirely air conditioned, I, I'm glad I don't have to pay their electricity bill. Um, whether or not you think that Singapore is actually an exception, um, given, given that. Was that addressed to me? Did yeah, it was addressed to you. Well, the I way I understood it, whether uh, the case that you gave of, of Singapore being an exception mm -hmm. uh, is indeed true or not, given the fact that, uh, that S Singapore exists as it exists now only because of uh, highly developed technology, especially air conditioning, uh, but 
uh, under previous conditions yeah, where, you, yes, where yes. you did not have these sorts of things, um, if things might have been different then. But yes. is, is, is that roughly right? Yes, well, um, I see you have a point there. Um, air conditioning keeps the temperature down in Singapore, so they aren't really adversely affected by tropical climates, uh, as we might suppose they would be. I think, the, um, so if we discount them, the whole climatic factor is so highly correlated with the IQ factor, um, such as the IQs are higher in the cool, temp cool latitudes and then they decline and they decline further. They're so confounded that it's difficult to isolate which is uh, whether climate actually has an effect or whether this is uh, some genetic effect. Where I take the view that Hans Hoppe uh, outlined that uh, the reason for these IQ differences is that uh, human beings evolved in, ec in equatorial Africa uh, about 120,000 years ago. And some of them migrated northwards into the cooler latitudes of North Africa and then some migrated further into Europe and East Asia. And there, um, it was, the uh, conditions of living were much more cognitively demanding. You know, had to, they had to evolve higher intelligence in order to survive up there in these cold latitudes, particularly during the ice ages, of course, where a lot of this uh, New Europe was covered in, was just below the ice sheets, and it was much more difficult to survive then than this, in this warm period that we live in today. So, um, I think that is, uh, as Hans Hobby said, really the most plausible explanation for these differences. But definitely we should, uh, should not look forward to global warming, but for global cooling. <laughs> and it will help. But also, real quick, the, the air conditioning actually proves the opposite of what I think you're trying to prove, in the sense that, uh, you know, in the American South, you have a, a more backward economy. Hi there. Uh, my question is to Mr. Spencer and Mr. Lynn uh, regarding this whole issue about looking at groups in terms of IQ. Um, my question is, uh, how does attempting to prove genetic differences amongst groups of millions of people on an IQ test advance the cause of individual liberty and uh, uh, private property? Um, I suspect everybody here is against collectivism. You know, raise your hand if you're not against collectivism. Take a quick poll. Okay, so nobody. So everybody here is against collectivism and, and groupism. And so I, I'm, in my mind, struggling to find the, the uh, I see the value of open intellectual inquiry in everything. And so every, nothing should be taboo as a topic of investigation. But my question is as it relates to the property and freedom, uh, you know, context that we're here, where is the, the link? Um, uh, is there any prescription from this research? In other words, uh, should I look at an individual that I don't know on the street differently based on the fact that their group may score differently than the group that I'm a part of? Okay. And, uh, and no, then, no and but I have to, at this point, I have to intervene for, sure. for a second. Um, look, if you look, what is the cause or one of the major causes for the diminishing rights of private property owners that we see going on for decades? Mm -hmm. And the, an the answer is precisely all humans are equal and we have to do something about it if the outcomes are not the same. Mm -hmm. So if you want to protect private property rights, if you want to protect individual rights, then you have to make a point, yes, they are not equal, they are unequal, uh, and the fact that the results are different, uh, we just don't care about this. Sure. So it does have tremendous, tre tremendous direct connection with 
uh, with property and freedom. Our freedoms are threatened precisely by those people who always claim we are not allowed to talk about these subjects and uh, discrimination is the cause for all of these sure. different results that we see. Sure. So I, uh, I do not uh, I do, uh, My I question recognize is some slight criticism there of just talking about these sort of things. No, I'm not, not, not willing I, to accept that. My, my actual, to, my bottom line question is if I assume that the research is correct and that amongst these different groups there is in fact uh, these IQ differences and that they explain uh, uh, income differences, if I just accept them as true, and I, I don't know the research, but let's assume they're true. My, my question is, um, won't the state use that proof as a justification for egalitarianism, as a justification for more wealth redistribution, as a justification for affirmative action, that, hey, these people, now we prove that these people are different, and it's really unfortunate, but now we know it's a fact. These people are not as uh, smart as these people, so we need extra help. We need to subsidize their education more. We need to make sure they have better job opportunities because who wants to live in a world, you know, where you keep people down with just because they have a disability? I mean, you know, nobody says that somebody who's in a, a, a wheelchair shouldn't be allowed access, right? So my, my concern is, will this reinforce the state's agenda? You, you, you make a very good point. Um, okay, you make a very good point. And um, I, I think I, I, I agree with, um, uh, with, with Hans that in some ways, it, talking about IQ differences, this, this doesn't have a great positive effect. As I mentioned in my talk, I, I don't think there's going to be any great consciousness raising by talking about IQ, like we whites have a 100 IQ, go us. I mean, that's just that's ridiculous. Uh, but, but it is defensive in the sense that there are people who are the tax eaters, there are people who are federal uh, employees of the government. And if we actually do, oh, it, are able to get rid of this uh, socialist welfare order that we have. They are not going to benefit. It's not going to be good for them. Uh, I, I think so much of the black middle class really exist due to federal employment. Uh, and sadly, that's not going to exist anymore uh, if we can, if, when the United States government's collapse due to its you know, massive debt and foreign wars and, and things like that. So you, you have to be able to say uh, something, and, 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 and as, as Hans is pointing out, that, that, that people are, equal, are unequal, they're going to be unequal outcomes, but that's fine because you, know, you need a, to, for a society to function, you need bankers, but you also need cement layers, you need roofers, you need uh, shopkeepers, you, know, you, you, need, you need novelists, you need a whole spectrum. And that is, a, that is actually a, a, a very humane and a, a way of viewing the world, that we, you know, we all have an individual destiny that's different. Uh, you can do it that way. I think it's a good point. There was actually one person who criticized uh, uh, Charles Murray and, and Herrnstein's bell curve. And uh, I, if I, I can't remember his name at the moment, but I, he basically made a kind of Rawlsian argument of, uh, uh, I'm not sure whether IQ differences between races is true, but if it were, since how you, you know, which race you were born into is so arbitrary, uh, that that would be a very strong justification for socialism. And therefore, we need to ramp up uh, socialism because of Charles Murray. So, I mean, I think the way I would answer this is that just that, you know, I, IQ differences, it's, it's not the, the whole thing. I mean, this is an important component. It can be an important uh, defensive component. But no one would ever base a political movement or a movement of identity or, you know, European consciousness or, or a, a new right wing on IQ. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's one component that's important we should study, but it, it's not. And as, as you can say, you know, you can make an a, you can make a, a IQ, a, a IQ wise uh, egalitarian argument, you know. Uh, let me speak uh, first. I, I was, uh, uh, I've been considering your question for about 40 years. And uh, I think it's an excellent question. And, I'm, and I, I had the same thought. I mean, why uh, are the leftist social engineers, the bureaucrats, the, 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 the media, everything, why are they so terrified of saying people are born with different IQs uh, and uh, their achievements are going to be, are going to be varied, uh, and we have to adopt some eugenics policy or something to change this, or give like special rights to those who have lower IQs. Um, you know, why don't they do something like? I mean, this was, there were people in the uh, uh, pre World War One period who believed exactly things like that, um, and the usual answer is we saw how bad the Nazis were, or that something like. 
Well, this, I think, is non, it's, it's, it's propaganda. Uh, the reality is we've seen how bad the Soviets are. They killed even more people, and yet we engage in massive social engineering and income redistribution. So it's highly selective lessons from the past that we seem to be taking. Um, and, uh, you know, the Nazis, as far as, I, as someone pointed out, they did not consider Jews to be slouchers. They thought they were very bright, but they killed them anyhow. Um, so, I mean, to say that people have lower or higher IQs is not going to be turn you into a Nazi, uh, with all due respect to, I don't know, uh, uh, the American media and the European media even more. But it seems to me that once you make the argument that people have, d have different IQs, you're saying there's natural inequality. This is something the left and the neoconservatives cannot live with. And the, politi the, the, the political spectrum in Europe, the respectable. You cannot live with the idea that people are not equal. Um, you can't accept the fact that some are handicapped, you know, and you do things for them. But at the same time, you say they're just as good or maybe better than, than others. But there's something about IQ that, that's really um, uh, def a, a definitive mark uh, among people. And it has been used in the past to make moral qualitative distinctions. Uh, between people. So once, once you buy into that, it would seem to be that you're, you're, you're accepting a very, very dangerous, in terms of the left's understanding of the world, it's a very dangerous kind of, therefore we have to totally suppress any discussion. Point number two, uh, once you have done this, you can have a totalitarian regime, which of course the left is always in, in, in the name of equality. So anyone who brings up this, this, this topic, which is, which is uh, strengstens verboten, once you mention this, we are going to kick you out of your job, send you to retraining programs. Um, uh, and uh, I think, as Richard also pointed out, there is a very large minority middle class in the United States which lives off white guilt. You know, and people are guilty because we didn't give this group enough or that group enough. And these are all artificial differences, we're told. And state administrators and particularly and disproportionately minority members, the middle class, who do not serve other blacks, they serve, they basically serve white liberals and they enrich themselves uh, through the state. Um, they are taking advantage. They are there to help equalize us, fight discrimination and teach political correctness. So there's a very large professional, economic, social investment in maintaining uh, this um, fictitious situation. Uh, but, I th but beyond that, I think there's also the, um, the basic commitment of the left to uh, inherent egalitarianism. And once you deny that people are cognitively equal, um, the whole structure of ideas may fall apart. Yeah, but... I just want to say one thing. You, I think your question is, is good, and the answer is nothing. You don't do anything with these things because for freedom, to enhance freedom or anything. It's just because all your answers were, well, we talk about it because our enemies hate it. And it's, uh, it's a good thing. You know, we could start using all sorts of words that our enemies hate. But we're talking in an ideal world because the major... What I, what I can see from uh, Richard's work, the major prescription that comes out, policy prescription, is that it's a waste of money to give certain people welfare. But in, the, in our world, there would be no welfare to give anybody. We wouldn't give Hans one dollar of welfare or anybody who we consider somehow intelligent or stupid. We, we wouldn't give welfare to anybody. So as far as... Uh, your question is concerned, I think, uh, yes, it's good. We can talk about IQs and uh, we can measure them, although Albert Einstein did not believe in, you know, he never took an IQ. And uh, at the same time, Joseph Go Goebbels did, and it was 164, so pretty amazing. Anyway, it's, uh, that's... Uh <laughs> to some of the answers that you just gave, and to your point about you actually have to confront your critics when they bring up a topic and talking about it, it seems like the conversation is being defined by the critics and they're saying egalitarianism is the way it is and, and we need groups to be equal and people to be equal, but sort of the response is to say, well, groups are unequal and, and these groups believe this, then it's back to groups again. And 
maybe the answer is in going down to the individual level and trying to put people in nation states. I mean, for goodness sakes, you're talking to me about IQs of people in nations. The whole point is we don't believe in nation states. We're like the astronauts and we don't even see these borders. We're meeting them on their battlefield, talking about their terms and their ideas when they don't even fit the problem that you're trying to solve and define. All individuals are different. Everyone knows, like Han says, in kindergarten, individuals are different. Maybe by coming at this on the group angle and lump lumping the IQs of nation states and these people and these people, we're messing up by joining a collective discussion. Sorry. Groups are very important. You, you, you also shouldn't conflate a nation state with a group. You can very much think that the welfare warfare nation state is a terrible thing, and I would agree with you. Uh, but that, that's something very different than an identity someone might have as someone who's Scottish or the identity that someone might have as someone who's European or Jewish or anything like that. There, there, there are certainly nations that have no state uh, and, and there are forms of identity that have no state. Also, as, a, as an Austrian uh, libertarian, I mean, you, you basically think that value is subjective. That, I mean, you could make a purely rational argument that uh, for, for open borders and that, you know, we, we should have populations to migrate to, uh, they could make adjustments with wages and salaries and prices and, and that would be most ideal for the production, but it doesn't, I think as, you know, as an Austro-Libertarian, you, you, the value is subjective, it's something that you can make, and that groups are extremely important. I mean, the, you know, you, uh, you, you can't get away from the idea that identity and, 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 and these kind of associations form a basis of authority for people that they might very well might want to choose. You know, it might be in, in economically inefficient for someone to have a, a community that they decide is going to be Jewish, and it, it's just not a good idea. I, I, I don't want to stop them from doing that. Uh, you know, th that is their, you know, subjective uh, understanding of value. Uh, and so, you know, uh, that, that's how I'd answer it. You know, uh, the, the authority that comes from a certain kind of identity and group is very different than the welfare state. <laughs> It's on, on the similar topic, but basically one of the main things that Austrian economics is trying to suggest is that the root of progress in society is entrepreneurial creativity and entrepreneurship in general. And I don't see how any of this can be linked to IQ because it's such a one-dimensional measure of intelligence. I mean, a brilliant artist, like IQ essentially measures logical capacity. A brilliant artist may not have the capacity for logical thought in the strictly IQ sense. It doesn't mention your ability to perceive and understand language, your ability to learn new languages, your ability to be a creative individual. And I think as a, as a proxy for intelligence, it's a similar thing to what GDP is to prosperity. It gives you a figure, but it doesn't exactly tell you what is there. It's, it's just a proxy and I think a very bad one because I mean, People that are successful in life, like basketball players, for example, or ballet dancers or famous artists, they may not be capable of solving a very simple mathematical equation, but that doesn't make them unintelligent. But I think there you underestimate what these types of tests try to measure. You can take any profession that you want, uh, a bricklayer or a mathematician, a tailor or a plumber, um, and you will always find, in any profession, you'll find some people who are better at it and some people who are not as good, even on the layer, level of, of digging holes in the ground uh, or laying one brick on top of the other. Even there you find differences. <coughs> um, and yes, when it comes in, who of all the bricklayers in the world will become a more successful bricklayer? Who might actually become an entrepreneurial bricklayer? Who of all the plumbers in the world will be a plumber that has more clients and who will have less clients? It always boils down essentially to those who do better on these tests in any profession will tend to be rising to the top of their profession and those who do bad on these tests will not rise to the top of their profession, yeah. whatever the profession is. Well, also, you know, uh, I, did I turn it on? There. Okay. Uh, also, I mean, uh, I, I think this is, you know, one way of saying, you know, like, 
you know, Einstein, he, he never took an IQ test, and so it doesn't tell, it's, so therefore IQ tests are, are invalid. It, it, it doesn't follow. I mean, the other thing in terms of Beethoven, I mean, it, as a, you know, I did some comp uh, composition when I was in, uh, you know, an undergrad. Uh, Beethoven's, you know, uh, ability to compose music that's sublime uh, is, 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 you know, a thousand IQ points greater than my meager ability. Uh, but, you know, we, 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 we probably have a pretty similar IQ. I mean, you can't measure Beethoven's uh, genius with an IQ test, his ability to compose the nice symphony. But I guarantee you he did not have an IQ of 85. Uh, you know, I mean, there, there's, a, there's a basic, there's a kind of basic ground uh, that you need uh, for, for, for someone like, uh, um, you know, for Beethoven to, uh, to exist. There's actually a, one more point that I, I've lost and might come to me. I think we should just uh, stop stop right now. We've reached our time. Um, I just want to make one remark. The, these types of discussions, whether you agree with all the points or don't, these types of discussions you will not hear any place else. Uh, and I think it is of utmost importance that these things are discussed. Um, I hope that even those who are uh, not in agreement here uh, appreciate at least the fact that open discussion takes place about these subjects because you can go far and wide and you will not find a place where this is possible. Thank you. Thank you. just want to let you know that I got nothing against IQs. It was just a general proposition, actually. Uh, the IQ